everybody. I'm Steve Connolly. I'm the president of Connolly Partners. Uh, we have an office here in Boston. We also have an office in Vancouver. We have an office in uh, Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we're an ad agency at our core, but I think one of the things that's really helped us stand out is, frankly, it's our passion for anthropology. So let's get this out of the way right now. I love to watch people. I think what people do is way more interesting than what they say. And I think that's the core of what anthropology is. And if you think about it, there's a rise of anthropology right now. We need it now more than ever. And the reason is there's too much data around us. Um, your access to, to numbers, to facts, to algorithms, to uh, all of the different buckets of data that are presented to you on a constant stream of, of information that you're supposed to process, and it just gives you a headache. There's just so much data, and you feel obligated to do whatever the data tells you to do. You feel obligated to listen to the story that data and algorithms and technology are telling you to follow. And the thing is, man, that data is like overrated. It's integral to the process. It's absolutely pivotal to your decision making. But data exists to inform better questions. It doesn't exist to give you all the answers. If you're just going to sit there, read the data, and glean answers from, the, from what the numbers tell you to do, as opposed to looking at what people do and looking at the fact that they move through life and they do illogical, crazy-ass things, and they, they sometimes they try to figure out data tries to figure out how you can make sense of some things and it really can't however it can make you much smarter you can ask better questions but if you believe that the singular answers to marketing it's understanding people come strictly from an algorithm or a data scientist um, you're wrong there's a difference and there's things called big data and there's things called small data. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And there's things like anthropology and data science. And it, the reality is it's a seesaw. And the world's out of whack. The world's out of balance right now. If I don't have the same number of data scientists on one side of the seesaw and anthropologists on the other side, there's no balance. I'm not going to learn. Uh, I'm not going to learn truly from human behavior, why people buy what they buy, live where they live, drive what they drive, wear what they wear, all that kind of stuff. So this conversation that we're going to have today is really about figuring out how to use data, because it's critical and it's pivotal, but also how do you balance it with anthropology. All the data wonks out there, all the data scientists out there, probably my head of data and analytics is I'm going to have to hire a food taster because they're going to want to get rid of me, get me off the planet because of the stuff I'm saying, because they think I'm actually completely discounting what they do. I'm not. Let me go back to that earlier thing I said. Data is so valuable, so powerful. And you get into to examples in real life where you try to look at and say, the data doesn't make sense. We've all had experiences in life where the numbers lie and they don't add up. But, you know, I, I'll go back to, here's one sentence. Christy Brinkley was once Mrs. Billy Joel. I want you to process that. I want you to get a mental image in your, in your head of what Billy Joel looks like and what Christy Brinkley looks like. There's no buddy daddy in the world that says these two should go together. It doesn't make sense on every, same thing can be said of me and my wife, by the way, and has been said to me. I'll live with that. But the fact is that there was some chemistry, there was some organic magic, there was something that brought those th people together that, you know, opposites attract, you've certainly heard that a million times. But people come together and they make decisions about who they're with or what they buy, and we can't really understand them all the time. It's like, if you believe in the data, you know, if you believe in the power of matchmaking algorithms, then you, you kind of discount the ability of magic of relationships and how you really can't you really can't put a scientific barometer on some of this stuff. Here's another one for you. I'm sure everyone saw the Super Bowl or at least read about the Super Bowl. And we're here in Boston. We have a love for, for Tom Brady. But seriously, before that game outside of Boston, who in their right mind would have assumed that a 43-year-old quarterback 
is going to beat the reigning MVP of the league, the most athletic, the most dynamic, the most exciting player in the league. Everyone tunes in to watch Patrick Mahomes. He's going to win a bunch of Super Bowls down the road. But who's going to possibly believe that one guy that's 43 and moves like me is going to outperform Patrick Mahomes? There's a lot of bookies in Las Vegas that are very, very, very thankful you bet on Mahomes. Data wasn't really giving you the best picture of what you should bet on, what you thought was going to happen in that instance. Magic happens. Please accept the existence of magic in marketing. Accept the reality of your logic. And you're going to make better decisions because you're going to have balance, the seesaw. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. Let's start with, well, let's start with me because I'm here and you're there. This could be about you, but this is really about me and I think you and I are probably the same in this regard. I'm a human being. I'm flawed. I make mistakes. I have a left brain. I have a right brain. I do things that are logical. I do things that are irrational. I'm a dude. I'm a dad. I buy stuff. Let's stop there. I buy stuff. You sell stuff. The mission right now is to figure out how are you going to help figure out how to sell to me. And you're going to try to climb inside my head and you're going to try to figure out what makes him tick, what makes him buy the stuff he buys. Here's a clue. I don't know. And you don't know either. Because a lot of times you jump into the buying process and the right brain takes over and you buy something based on color, based on the fact that somebody else I know owns it or buys it and I want to be associated with them. You know, and, and it's like, I don't know why I buy the stuff I buy. Um, and the reality is, is that when you accept the fact that rational thinking doesn't determine purchase behavior, sometimes it does for big purchases like, you know, your house or sometimes even your car. You want to feel like you did your homework. But at the end of the day, you want to live in a cool house because it's got a kitchen appliance and you convince yourself that that's why you want to live there. Push all the data aside, but you like the color of a car, you know, or something like that. And so what we do is, and, and we've talked about um, big data and small data. And big data are the numbers and the hard facts and the stuff like that. But and small data tends to fall into things like focus groups. And even that is totally flawed. Big data could not predict that Donald Trump was going to win 2016. And the reason is because people didn't want to admit in pre-polling that they were actually vote for the guy. They kept their opinions to themselves. That's actually a great example of how data can mislead a direction. And that's what happens in focus groups. I think people tend to say what they think you want to hear in a focus group. We do things that are called friendship groups far more interesting and honest than a focus group. A friendship group is actually, um, we would collect a group of friends, people that know each other, uh, and it's hosted in a house, not in a facility. And uh, everybody is, of course, connected in some way. You kind of introduce some alcohol into the whole uh, um, dynamic, and you start talking about stuff. And the cool thing about a friendship group is because they know each other, they call each other out. So let's say somebody in a, in a friendship group, we're talking about a food product and somebody in a friendship group says that they eat healthy and they try to work out all the time, and, and which is what you want to hear. Meanwhile, the person next to them that's had a glass of wine, she might turn to her or he might turn to him and say, you're so full of shit. I said, I see your trash goes out every Tuesday and it's filled with pizza boxes. And I've never seen you outside exercising. That stuff happens in a friendship group where there's a little bit more of a disarmed environment where everybody can call each other out and friends do that. Um, people in focus groups are strangers and they really don't. So I talked a little bit about big data and you know, we've all seen it. It's, it's the machine, the giant machine of which I've hired some incredibly intelligent people and I use some incredibly valuable information that big data gives you. Big data is really about the, the numbers, the stats, the how much and where you live and uh, um, um, where you go and, 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 and facts and figures and, 
and certainly trait and motivation stuff is, is, is part of that. But really, you need to make sure that you celebrate a bunch of why questions too. You got to ask, you know, why does somebody dress that way? Why did they do that? Why did they walk up to an elevator button that's already lit? Why did they push it five, six, seven, eight times? It's already lit. Do they really think that's going to make the elevator move any faster? No. There's so many why questions. We tend to not ask why in marketing. We tend to rely on the what that the data is presenting to you, the, the, those numbers, looking at a sheet of paper and trying to think that the bits and the bytes and the numbers on that, on that page are really going to reveal why people do what they do. And the reality is you want to sit back and anthropologically answer your questions based on the illogic of human behavior. We do so many crazy things that are completely illogical and you can't explain it. I've, if you are walking down the street and you see a baby in a carriage, you will smile. There is no data scientist and no algorithm that can explain why the muscles in your face make that motion and create a smile when you see that baby, but you do. Why do we want to pet dogs? What is it in data that says when you see an adorable dog, you want to, you want to give it a stroke across the head? Why? Ask these questions. Why is the biggest question that's missing in marketing and the most valuable question you can ask if you want to trigger, try to figure out how to sell stuff? I do think it's important to talk about the fact that what data tends to do is it kind of puts everybody in buckets. And when you're thinking about entering a new market or you're going to go appeal to a new audience or you're moving into a new country to sell your stuff, instinctively you look for things that are different in that country. There are cultural nuances. There are different lenses you have to look at. There are different sayings. There are things you can say, things you can't. I had no idea, for example, in, in Ireland that this was actually this in the States. And you got to be very careful. My son was in Ireland crossing the street. He said thank you to somebody like that. They almost ran the poor guy over because they gave him the finger. You got to know these cultural nuances. You got to know that you can't say things necessarily in all places that, that are unilaterally applicable. But I think there's a preoccupation, preoccupation with looking for those things that make us different. And what that does is that drags you away from looking at those things that make us all the same. Human beings are functionally the same. We're much more similar than we are dissimilar. And data actually forces you and creates this lure of magic that you're going to find in the differences between people. All I'm saying is that with an anthropological focus and a focus on observation, you're going to find a lot more sameness. And that sameness um, and identifying those things that are functionally human, uh, that's going to help you sell more stuff. Like, don't be so preoccupied looking for the things that make you different that you miss the stuff that makes us the same. Anthropology will, re will, um, will reveal that to you, and frankly, you're going to find it way more valuable. The make sure you don't do this crossing the street in Dublin, uh, but at the same time, that's something that kind of you should be aware of. But that shouldn't dictate your communications plan or your strategy for entering a new market. Observing people. That's far more valuable than listening to them. We did, we did a shop along um, for a supermarket that we were working for. And the, the exercise was we would give everybody um, the money to pay for their shopping their food shopping, if we could just go along with them and observe while they shop and, you know, see if they're looking at labels and how they examine produce. But it's really interesting to watch somebody shop as opposed to just give us a list of the things that you bought. So we did this one out in New York. We did this one shop along where we um, had this really fit young guy. Muscles on muscles, he had a teeny tiny waist, big strong guy, worked out all the time and we went shopping with him and he bought during that uh, shopping trip, exactly what you would expect him to buy. You know, he bought vegetables, fruits, uh, um, healthy stuff. <clears throat> um, go through the whole story, gets to the checkout line, and he starts shuffling his feet. 
and eye, avoiding eye contact with our strategist at the time. And it became a, something that we had to uh, call out. So the, the anthropologist said, what's wrong? And he goes, okay, I haven't been totally honest with you. This isn't what I'd buy on a Tuesday, and the, which was odd. And so we say, okay, let's go back and get what you get on a Tuesday. The guy goes back into the store. He buys a rump roast and a six-pack of pudding and brings it out to the checkout counter. And our guy's like, okay, that's interesting. You get through the shopping, get outside to the parking lot. We go to the guy, hey, wh what the hell was up with that? And he said, well, it's Tuesday. Okay. Uh, on Tuesday, I don't work out. It's the one day I don't work out. What I do is I cook myself a steak, I eat a six pack of pudding, and I watch Star Trek reruns all night long, which says two things. One is that food for him was a reward. And it's important to know that nuance if you're going to be a place that markets food. And two, this man is going to die alone. But he'll be in great shape when he dies. That's something that you can only get from watching. To really drive home the point that there has to be a balance, you have to incorporate the hard data and the anthropological data. They have to combine. You have to integrate them. To really drive home that point, I have this study that I saw from McKinsey. McKinsey, not known for anthropology, by the way, known for great data generation, both you know hard data and soft data. And they had a study that, um, that came out that said, um, if you're trying to create annual growth in your company and you just use a strictly data-driven approach to marketing, the growth of that company comes out to about 2.93%. Um, if you're an integrator, and you use data and creative process in terms of creating strategies to grow your business, and you put them together, the, um, the growth of those companies are 3.52%. Hard facts, hard data, that it's not one, it's not the other, it's the combination and integration of data and the creative process, anthropology, observation, that will ultimately create more success for your company. Let me close with another little analogy or a story and look forward to getting your questions at the end here. Anything I can expound on and I, I think actually having a conversation with you guys is very helpful um, for me because again, I'm an anthropologist, I'm curious, I wanna hear what people say. But there's a couple of questions out there that haunt us. Uh, one of them is why is so much marketing bad? Uh, why are so many commercials on TV horrible? Um, what example can I give you of a story that would kind of explain that? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use something I've used for years as a story. Um, all of the women in the audience will know exactly the answer to this. All of the men will be typically clueless because we are, as a gender, moronic. Here's your story. A guy walks into a bar. At the end of the bar is the most beautiful girl in the world, and there's an empty stool next to her. Now, and she's just not beautiful. She's the whole package. She's funny. She's great wit, great entertaining, great to be with. Everything about this person is exactly what you were looking for. And in marketing, that's your core customer. That's the person you're trying to sell to. So guy walks into the bar, most beautiful girl in the world is at the end of the bar, empty stool. Your job is to walk into that bar, sit on that stool, and get her phone number and leave with it. Start a conversation. Man walks in, sits on that stool. Every woman out there knows the first and only thing that guy's gonna talk about for the first five minutes. I see you nodding, you know what it is, and most guys out there, you're like, what? All a guy can talk about when he sits on that stool is himself. Uh, where I work, what kind of car I drive, maybe your name drop, how much money you make, or who your best friend is. It's all about you, 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 you. And that's what marketers do, and that's why you see so much bad advertising. Data has dictated that you're only focused on those data points about you, and you actually think that she gives a rat's ass about you. And she doesn't. Now, the anthropologist, who's actually gonna leave with that girl's phone number, sits on that stool and he stops and he observes. What's she drinking? What's she wearing? What's she watching on TV? Um, what are her friends like? and you try to figure out a way to engage in a conversation 
that's based on something that's important to her. And our job as marketers is to lie like rugs and say that what's important to her is what's important to you because that will get a conversation started. Conversations build long-term marketing relationships. Talking about yourself will get you shut down in marketing as fast as it's going to get you shut down in that bar. So with that, thank you very much for your time and look forward to any questions you might have.